Biafra is more than a human tragedy. It's the fate, I believe, would mark the end of African independence. Biafra was the first place I had been to in Africa where the Africans themselves were truly in charge. Life in Biafra The Nigeria Biafra conflict created a humanitarian emergency of epic proportions, millions of civilians, grandparents, mothers, fathers, children, and soldiers alike flooded the main highway arteries between towns and villages, fleeing the chaos and conflict. They traveled by foot, by truck, by car, barefoot with slippers and wheelbarrows, many in worn-out shoes. Some had walked so long their souls were blistered and bleeding. As hunger and thirst grew, so did despair, confusion, and desperation. Most were heading in whatever direction the other was headed, propelled by the latest rumors of food and shelter spreading through the multitude like a virus. Refugees were on the move in no specific direction, anywhere, just away from the fighting. As they fled the war zones, they became targets of the Nigerian Air Force. The refugees learned to travel night and hide in the forest by day. The International Relief Agency started responding to the growing humanitarian challenge quite early in the conflict by establishing food distribution centers and refugee camps. There were many Biafran refugee camps dotting the landscape from Enugu in the north to Owari in the south during the 30-month conflict. Many held between a few hundred and a few thousand people. At the height of the war, there were well over 3,000 such centers and camps, a great number but woefully inadequate to the actual need. These camps were often hastily constructed tent villages set up beside bombed out churches in football or sports arenas or in open field in the forest. They uniformly lacked electricity, running water or other comforts. Occasionally, the more established camps had stored their shelters on the premises of abandoned schools or colleges or built near freshwater stream or little rivers. Those were few and far between. Most had rows of mud huts and palm raffia roofs built hastily by the inhabitants themselves. They were occasionally fenced in by the international agencies, which placed guards on the camp perimeter to monitor movements in and out of the area. The relief agencies often hoisted their flags to indicate to the Nigerian officers that they were in neutral zones that should be protected from assault. That did not always keep the Nigerian troops from raiding these safe havens or even from bombing them. Life in the camps varied in quality. Some of the better organized camps provided water, shelter, food, basic health care, mainly vaccinations for children against the most prevalent diseases and treatment of common bacterial infections and education. Other camps could only be described as a deplorable, epidemic reading graveyard. In these camps, the combination of poor sanitation, high population density, and shortages of supplies created a bitter cocktail of despair, giving rise to social pathologies and psychological traumas of all kinds, violence, extortion, and physical and sexual abuse. My siblings and their families returned to my father's house in Ogidi from various parts of the country. The family did too. Christy and my children, at the time, Chinelo and Ike, left Port Harcourt for my family's ancestral home. My village is about six miles from Monicha, the commercial hub of eastern Nigeria and the location of the largest market in West Africa. Onicha is also where the famous Niger Bridge is located, and so it served as the entry point for all travelers entering the east from points west. The close proximity of Ogiri to Onicha meant that we were in the eye of the storm, as it were, right at the border of the conflict. We were so close to the war zone, 
we could hear the sounds of war, heavy artillery fire, bombs, and machine gun fights. By the time I left Lagos to join my family in Ogidi, there were rumors that the Nigerian army was not that far behind. Casting my mind back, I am surprised at how little pandemonium there was during the early stages of the conflict. Families casually began to move deeper into the countryside to prepare for the inevitability of war. Food was short, meat was short, and drugs were short. Thousands, no, millions by then, had been uprooted from their homes and brought into safer areas, but where they really had no relatives, no property, many of them lived in school buildings and camps. The Committee for Biafran Refugees, understandably overwhelmed, did what it could. I found it really quite amazing how much people were ready to give. Beyond the understandable trepidation associated with a looming war, one found a new spirit among the people, a spirit one did not know existed, a determination in fact. The spirit was that of a people ready to put in their best and fight for their freedom. Biafran churches made links to the persecution of the early Christians, others on radio to the inquisition and the persecution of the Jewish people. The prevalent mantra of the time was Ojuku give us gun to fight a war. It was an energetic infection duty song, one sung to a well-known melody and used effectively to recruit young men into the People's Army, the Army of the Republic of Biafra. But in the early stages of the war, when the Biafran army grew quite rapidly, sadly Ojuku had no guns to give to those brave souls. But the most vital feeling Biafrans had at the time was that they were finally in a safe place, at home. This was the first time and the most important thing, and one could see the signs of acceleration and the efforts that the people were putting into the war. Young girls, for example, had taken over the jobs of controlling traffic. They were really doing it by themselves. No one asked them to. That this kind of spirit existed made us feel tremendously hopeful. Clearly, something had happened to the psyche of an entire people to bring this about. Richard West, a British journalist, was so captivated by the meticulous nature with which Biafrans conducted the affairs of state that he wrote a widely cited article in which he lamented. Biafra is more than a human tragedy. It's the fate, I believe, would mark the end of African independence. Biafra was the first place I had been to in Africa where the Africans themselves were truly in charge. Soon after I arrived in Ogidi, we were told that Nigerian soldiers led by Motala Mohammed were trying to cross the Niger Bridge from Asabae to Onicha, and were being kept at bay by the Biafran colonel Achuzia, aka Air Raid Achuzia. Chua's troops were marching into Iboland across the Benue River in the north at the same time. There was quite an overwhelming sense of anxiety in the air. We had all gone to bed on one particular night, my family, Augustine and his family, and Frank and his family. We did not realize that Biafran soldiers had set up their armory outside my father's house, on the veranda, the porch, and outside in the yard. The house was in a choice location atop a small hill and was clearly chosen by the army as a perfect site from which to shell the advancing Nigerian army and to surprise them with sniper fire. By this time in the war, we, at least some of us, had gotten used to sleeping with the sound of shelling and explosions, an occasional howls of pain, and what some villagers call the stench of death. Others would recount that they did not sleep a wink through the war, an exaggeration of course, but a valid point nonetheless. Sleeplessness was endemic. 
On this particular night, we were oblivious to what was going on outside our father's house. While we were sleeping, the Biafran army was turning our ancestral home into a military base of sorts. No one asked us for permission. They did not knock to ask or to inform. In hindsight, what happened next was enough to have caused sudden cardiac arrest to some people. We all were awakened violently from sleep by a loud kaboom, followed by rattling of the house foundation and walls, indeed of the entire house. A number of people who were asleep fell off their beds violently or shot back into reality by the vibrations, the shock, and the noise of the artillery fire outside. It was awful. The men in the house went outside to find out what was going on. A colonel who was in charge of this exercise explained that they had decided to use our home as a tactical base because it provided them a logistical and strategic advantage as they shelled the encroaching federal troops. Surely it was time for us to leave.